Welcome to Reclaiming the Faith with Bill Baker, a podcast with a mission to reveal what the earliest Christians believed about the core issues facing us today. You can find links to all of Phil's resources at philsbaker.com. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen today. Take a moment to share this podcast with your friends. Now, here's Phil. Hey, y'all, this is episode 158 of Reclaiming the Faith, and this is such a special episode for me because it's the first episode of our series on Polycarp. My wife, Stephanie Baker, is here with me to uh, to do this episode and to do this entire series, and I'm so thankful for it. Hey, guys, my wife has a podcast called The Faithful Podcast with Stephanie Baker. There are a lot of episodes of people's testimonies of God's faithfulness in their lives through really difficult situations. So go check out The Faithful Podcast with Stephanie Baker. Leave a rating and review. And if you're blessed by this episode, please consider leaving a positive rating and review as well on this channel, Reclaiming the Faith on whatever service you stream podcasts upon. Uh, I'm blessed to be a part of Omega Frequency, so go check out omegafrequency.com for all kinds of information on us and our uh, YouTube and Rumble channels, Omega Frequency. All right, well, without any further ado, let's get into episode 158. All right, everybody, we're getting into our first episode on Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. And with me is now my permanent co host, Miss <laughs> Stephanie Baker. Mrs. Stephanie Baker. Thank you. I am a Mrs. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. This is going to be great. Yeah. So, basically, what we're going to do, we're going to introduce the book a little bit. Then we're going to read the first three sections of Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. So uh, let's go ahead and get into this. Introducing Polycarp a little bit. What do you know about Polycarp, Steph? Uh, He was discipled by the Apostle John. That's right. (laughs) That's right. That's what Irenaeus tells us. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, and he talks about that a little bit in around the year 180. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Polycarp possibly was the main leader of the church at Smyrna during uh, the time that John got his revelation about Jesus Christ. So yeah, Smyrna was one of the two churches in Revelation chapter 2 through 3 that Jesus did not rebuke. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Now, he's writing this letter to the Philippians because... Paul started the church at Philippi. You can see that in Acts chapter 16 with his buddy Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And they founded it there with uh, the jailer, the Roman jailer, and uh, Lydia and a few other women. Now, uh, Philippi was a colony of Rome, and we'll get into that a little bit more as we do the introduction. But uh, Paul was writing to them, to the Philippians around AD 60 through 61, to encourage them to continue living as citizens of heaven. Now, Polycarp writes about 50 to 80 years later to continue the church to do the same things that Paul was saying. So you're actually going to see a lot of Paul quoted by Polycarp in this letter, even though he was a disciple of John. You know, the apostles are all teaching the same thing. Uh, uh, Certain elements get highlighted that differentiate them uh, in, in the different apostolic letters, but Polycarp weaves many of their writings together and, uh, words from Jesus as well. So I really want to encourage you to see how many of these New Testament and Old Testament scriptures you can pick up as we go along. With that said, let's go ahead and get into the introduction. Stephanie, would you read that for us? Sure. 
From Polycarp and his clergy, to the colony of God's church at Philippi, all mercy and peace to you from God Almighty and Jesus Christ, our Savior. All right. Now, I I forgot to mention that the translation we're using is from Maxwell Staniforth's book, The Early Christian Writings, and subtitled The Apostolic Fathers. So you can check that out if you want to get a copy of that on Amazon. I really like that translation. Um, I'm also going to be using the copy of uh, Polycarp's letter to the Philippians um, that you can find on BibleStudyTools.com. So go check that out as well. So uh, here in the introduction, you don't just have Polycarp writing. It says clergy as well. Yeah, yeah. So these are the presbyters or the elders that are writing with Polycarp. And you would think if this dude is like the main bishop in Smyrna that he would address it that way, but that's not how he does it. He includes these elders. You have any thoughts about that? I'm, I mean, I don't, I'm not familiar with what other letters might look like, but I would say that that shows some humility that he's not trying to like uh, be attention seeking or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's not like one pastor to rule the church kind of thing. Uh, there's a shared leadership, yeah. uh, not just amongst all the bishops, but even in Smyrna, there's a shared leadership. Uh, Something that kind of was hitting me as you were talking about the history behind this is this is 50 to 80 years after, um, sorry, it was yeah, 50 yeah. to 80 years after Paul was writing to mm -hmm. Philippians. But the message is so in line with everything that Paul wrote. And like when you think about 50 to 80 years in like the life of what's going on in the church right now, how much different or how different the writings would be from, uh, you know, the big name pastors or whatever, you know, the church mm. leaders, the yeah. differences that you would see just because it seems a little more the church is going the way of the culture. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, this letter is addressed to God's church. To the colony of God's church. The colony of God's church at Philippi. Right. So just, just to back up a little bit, we said we were going to talk about colonies a bit. Philippi was a Roman colony, which means uh, Rome wanted people who were visiting Philippi to feel like they were in Rome. So if you went to Philippi, it would feel like you went to Rome. And so Philippi was given these things called benefactions, which were uh, aqueducts and amphitheaters, statues, different things that Rome had uh, so that uh, Philippi, Philippi could be uh, a little um, a little mini version of it. And so if this is God's church at Philippi and Paul is calling this a colony, or sorry, Polycarp is calling this a colony of God's church, then if you visited the church of God at Philippi, it would be like you're experiencing God's kingdom, hmm. the kingdom of heaven. Oof, yeah. Good. So pretty neat stuff. All right. So like, um, like Paul and the other uh, apostolic writers will do in the New Testament, they will give a blessing uh, after introducing themselves and saying who the letter is addressed to. Paul, uh, Polycarp gives this blessing, mercy to you and peace from God from God Almighty and from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Mm. Yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Um, if you remember, we've talked about in, in the previous episode in Creeds about how the Paul's use of the term Lord when it applied to Jesus is a very much an expression of Jesus's deity. And Paul also will frequently use Lord and Savior, which is what Polycarp does here. 
Now, Polycarp says the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior. So, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's also Lord and Savior. Those two terms get put together in Isaiah 43, uh, where the Lord, Yahweh, says, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I am the Lord. Apart from me, there is no Savior. I am God. So, you have this rich tradition from the Old Testament that the New Testament writers pull together to show how Jesus and Yahweh are one. Uh, it's just, this is not like modalism or anything like that or monarchianism. Uh, it's still very much Trinitarianism uh, in the early church, but Jesus Christ is God. Mm. Yeah. You have anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's good. All right, let's go on to chapter one. So Steph is going to uh, read that for us. Sure. When you welcomed those copies of the true love and took the opportunity of setting them forward on their road, it made me as happy in Jesus Christ as it did you. For those chains they were wearing were the badges of saints, the diadems of men truly chosen by God and our Lord. It does my heart good to see how the solid roots of your faith, which have had such a reputation ever since early times, are still flourishing and bearing fruit for Jesus Christ. In him, endurance went so far as to face even death for our sins. But God overruled the pangs of the grave and raised him up to life again. Though you never saw him for yourselves, yet you believe in him in a glory of joy beyond all words, which not a few others would be glad to share, well knowing that it is by his grace you are saved, not of your own doing, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. That's really good stuff. Um, I see you got a lot of notes on this. That's really cool. Wow. That that first thing that it looks like you highlighted was uh, these true copies. No, copies of their of the true love. Copies of the true love. Yeah. So I just it just was really hitting me how believers are supposed to be like little Christ, and is that really what we? I mean, do we look like copies? Mm. It's really cool because uh, that's kind of what the whole colony idea is about. Right, the church at Philippi being like a colony of heaven. And so the colonists are to be like rep replicas, uh, copies of the people from their home country. Mm. Yeah, so that's really neat. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Bible study tools translation, it just makes it really plain. It just says that they're following the example of the true love of mm. Jesus Christ, basically. So that's really neat. Now, in the next little section, it talks about uh, these believers. How are they being copies of the Lord Jesus Christ's true love? It says that they're wearing chains, mm. which are badges of the saints and diadems or like crowns of men who are truly chosen by God. Anything mm -hmm. in that standing out to you? Uh, I mean, yeah, I like the suffering aspect that Jesus went through, but uh, also like, I don't know, I've been thinking, I was, it was kind of making me think about like, we all are going to serve somebody. So like, we're all going to be in chains in some way, but mm. like, are there going to be, are these chains going to be ones that bring transformation and bring God, honor to God? Or I don't know, I was just, yeah, picturing a lot of the things that chain us down. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, to me, one of the, the cool things about that is he's contrasting uh, persecution mm -hmm. with, uh, not contrasting, but he's, he's, he's linking persecution with roots. Mm. And that's something that happens in the parable of the sower. So three versions of that in the synoptics, you can see it in Matthew 13, uh, Mark 4 and Luke 8. And um, in the seed that is sown on rocky soil, the sun comes up 
and scorches the seed because it did not have deep roots mm. or solid roots. And Polycarp is saying that these guys have strong roots, mm -hmm. which is really cool. He's talking about yeah. the foundation that Paul laid. He's like, Paul did a really good job in you guys. Yeah. Paul was modeling the love of Jesus Christ toward that jailer. And he's saying like, you guys followed Paul's example, which is really neat. Cause like, there's this belief amongst Jehovah's witnesses and Mormons, kind of like we talked about that. They think that after the apostles, the faith got really corrupted. And if you read Polycarp's letter, here it is like a couple generations later after the apostles and Polycarp's like, you guys are acting just like not only Paul, you're acting like Jesus too. Mm. That's good. So this really goes against that fake news narrative of some of the um, the cults around us. Yeah, I think that also in there the phrase the diadems of men uh, truly chosen by God and our Lord. Well, like diadems are like symbols of royalty and status, and the things associated with like what a king would have. And I think that in, you know, like in comparing that to our chains is it's something that we should, you know, be proud of in the sense that like, you know, we're proud to suffer for, for the right cause, but we were truly chosen by God. You know, we're, we're suffering, like it doesn't feel like that. And I think when, if you have this attitude that like suffering is something to embrace, that I've been chosen by God to do this, and this is something not shameful, this is something that is a, an bringing honor to God. And um, it may not bring honor to me, especially not in the moment, but it should be bringing honor to God. That's, that sh if we live with that kind of a mindset, then it changes our whole outlook towards suffering. Yeah, and Polycarp get it, gets into the why we mm -hmm. should do that, you know, why we should live to glorify God because he talks about how Jesus' endurance went so far even as to face, face death for our sins. Uh, but God overruled the pangs of the grave and raised him up to life again. So that's that's really cool. So he, he's kind of hitting on the whole uh, Acts 2 message from Peter, uh, which quoted uh, Psalm 16 about the resurrection, you know, death not uh, holding him. He wasn't kept in Sheol, you know, or in Hades. But then uh, Polycarp quotes Peter. He quotes 1 Peter 1, and he says that, even though you never saw him for yourselves, you believed in him in a glory of joy beyond all words. He's pulling right from 1 Peter 1, which is really cool also because it's showing that this letter of 1 Peter was circulated. It, it was getting around uh, into Asia Minor, which is where, in, that's, that's where Smyrna is, uh, and, um, that's one of the places that, uh, that Peter addresses his letter. He writes it to the churches in Asia. And so it got into Polycarp's hands there in Smyrna in Asia Minor, which is really neat. So it's showing this, this is a genuine letter believed by the early church to be from Peter, which is cool. Mm. But then he doesn't just quote first Peter. He quotes a letter from Paul. Do you see that? Are you talking about Ephesians? Yeah. Yeah. Can you read your part? Um, you the well, it starts with his by his grace you are saved, not of your own doing, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. Yeah, like, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. By grace you're saved, not of works, mm -hmm. not of your own doing. Right. Yeah. So that's really cool too, showing that. Ephesians was a letter also written to the people in Asia Minor. So that's in Polycarp's neck of the woods. And he's saying, guys, we got to put that into practice. Now, what you're going to see in chapter two, that's the end of chapter one. 
We got one more section to go. What you're going to see, though, is a very balanced approach to salvation. He just quoted, it's by grace you're saved, not of works. So nobody can boast. Right. But now in chapter two, we're going to see a whole lot of basically works. So, Steph, you want to read chapter two for us? So gird up your loins now and serve God in fear and sincerity. No more of the vapid discourses and sophistries of the vulgar. Put your trust in him who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory and a seat at his own right hand. All things in heaven and earth have been made subject to him. Everything that breathes pays homage to him. He comes to judge the living and the dead, and God will require his blood at the hands of any who refuse him allegiance. And he that raised him from the dead will raise us also, if we do his will and live by his commandments and cherish the things he cherished. If, that is to say, we keep ourselves from wrongdoing, overreaching, penny-pinching, tale-telling, prevaricating, and bear in mind the words of our Lord Jesus, of our Lord in his teaching, judge not that you be not judged, forgive and you will be forgiven. Be merciful that you may obtain mercy. For whatever you measure out to other people will be measured back again to yourselves. And again, happy are the poor and they who are persecuted because they are righteous for theirs is the kingdom of God. So it's really interesting that to me that right after Polycarp says it's by grace you're saved, not of works, he goes Job on us. When Mm. Job is like... um, Gird up your loins. Well, that's what God says to Job because Job's like, I want an audience with you. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you face to face basically. And God's like, okay, Put on your cup. You know, like, it's going to be a fight. No? Is that too much? It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's okay. like, this is, this is going to be a battle. And yeah. Peter does the same kind of thing when he's talking about facing Jesus as a judge. I mean, so right here, again, actually, uh, Polycarp is quoting First Peter 1. Uh, Gird up your loins, serve the Lord in fear. So it's, it's really interesting. And... Um, yeah, yeah. Steph, did you have anything right off the top that you wanted to uh, to hit on? There were just a lot of words that I am not familiar with. Maybe I don't read enough of these older documents, but like vapid, I, I, I've heard before, but it just means it offers nothing. Sophistries, which is a hard one for me to say, is a false argument to deceive. Mm. Um, and... There were other, there were a couple other words, but like, no, you know, leave behind the things that are shallow, the things that offer nothing, and um, deceptive arguments, basically. This is, we're going to instead put our trust in him who raised our Lord. And instead, this is just the contrast of the way of the world and getting, I don't know, it sounds like really sucked into like a, I don't know if it's the right, it's like a headiness kind of, like mm. very intellectual sounding, but getting nowhere. And instead, this is how you're going to serve God. Instead, this is how you're going to trust him. And um, we need, you know, later on in the chapter, we're going to, we need to live by his commandments if, you know, we want to receive the blessing that's promised before. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Like it's it's great to have a lot of knowledge, mm-hmm. but really what we need is humility. Right. Humble ourselves um, before Him. Yeah, there's uh, some some definite um, Philippians two verbiage in here where He's saying like to Him, all things in heaven and on earth are are subject. Every spirit serves Him. All right, Steph, did you have something? Yeah. Um, I also noticed that he's using like him to represent Jesus and God interchangeably. Mm. Like he's 
he's speaking, you know, giving that relationship language, but he's just using this him and his because it's, it's the same, you know, like it's, they serve different functions, but it's, he's using them interchangeably. And then he goes into everything that let every, or everything that breathes pays him homage. Mm. And that made me think of Psalm 156, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, that, that next passage or the next uh, phrase after he's coming to judge the living and the dead Mm -hmm. and God will require his blood at the hands of any who refuse him allegiance. When I read that, I was like, man, that is such good theology there. It's a good apologetic as well for like, why would uh, God allow anybody to go to hell? And it's like, because his son paid the ultimate price for any who would believe in him to not have to be destroyed, but to have everlasting life. Mm. But if we're not going to believe on him, we're, we're taking on ourselves, uh, judgment, condemnation. We're, we're throwing off that gift that's offered to us. And God is like, if you're going to refuse my gift, the gift of my son, I'm not going to let you go unpunished for that. Mm. Like that my son gave too much for you to just scoff at or neglect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now he gets into um, some really interesting verbiage stuff and I'd love to get your thoughts on it. And uh, Polycarp writes, and he that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us also if, if yeah, we do his will and live mm-hmm. by his commandments, cherish the things he cherished. You know, it it seems on the surface to be uh, in contrast to by grace you are saved. Yeah. Right? Well, it's still the grace that saves. It's not the works that are able to save, but it it is... Um, yeah, it's it's what we do once we've been saved. This is how we live in that kind of new relationship. We are living by His commandments and cherishing the things we've been we've been made new. Yeah, yeah, and it's by grace through faith, right, that we're saved. You know, Polycarp says, if we do the will, right, if we do His will. Well, in John chapter 6, John says that this is the will of God to believe in the one he sent. Like to believe in Jesus is the will of God. Mm. So like one of the clearest pictures of licentiousness, not doing God's will, is refusing to believe in his son. That's a person of lawlessness in a sense. They are not doing the will of, uh, of, of God. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to believe in him though, doesn't just mean, doesn't just mean to believe that he died on the cross and that he rose again. It's also to embrace him as the Messiah, as the King, as the Lord of Lords and all those things. And with that, you know, it it should follow this obedience. Paul talks about that in uh, Romans chapter one, the obedience that like flows from faith. Peter talks about that in first Peter one as well. Like, so we're supposed to be obeying from the heart. Mm-hmm. And it's not that we're going to do this perfectly at all by any stretch of the imagination, but it's got to flow. Yeah, there. I think that the stuff it goes into right after that, um, and maybe you can explain a little more. But like overreaching, penny pe- penny pinching. Um, I don't. I mean, I the overreaching. I'm not really sure exactly what that means. Penny pinching. I'm assuming they mean like being greedy. Um, but and then tale telling, like lying, and then prevaricating. I had to look up meant deviating from the truth or lying. 
Um, but the overreaching, what does that mean? Yeah, I think that's like covetousness or greed. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So some of this language in this translation, I guess, is still just a little bit unfamiliar to me. Yeah. In the Bible study tools translation, it says, uh, keeping ourselves away from unrighteousness, covetousness, love of money, Mm. evil speaking, false witnesses. And then Polycarp goes into Sermon on the Mount or Mm -hmm. Sermon on the Plain talk, which is really interesting. So he hits on, it's either Matthew 7 or Luke 6, and you see it really well in Luke 6, all of these together. Judge not so you're not judged. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Be merciful that you may obtain mercy. And what measure you use, it shall be measured to you. So it's really interesting that right after, you know, he's talking about serving the Lord in fear uh, and doing his will, he goes right into Sermon on the Mount. This is like... What it looks like to live it out. Yeah, it's it's a citizen of heaven. What a citizen of heaven should 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 do. What a colony of heaven as a community should be doing. Uh, this is... This is the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. If you read just the the few verses just before the Sermon on the Mount, um, Matthew talks about Jesus going into all the villages of the Galilee, basically preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Well, what is the gospel of the kingdom of heaven? It's the Sermon on the Mount Mm -hmm. and the Sermon on the Plain. This is what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And um, it's really uh, it's really interesting that he closes, Polycarp closes this uh, chapter two with the first words of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, and blessed are the poor and those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he kind of weaves in, a little bit of the uh, Sermon on the Plain. Mm -hmm. Uh, Blessed are the poor, not blessed are the poor in spirit. But you you get both of it. And those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the first and the last part of the Beatitudes, basically. The first and the last one. It's it's really neat. Um, and, And what you get from this is that there are two sides to the gospel message. If you're looking at a first or second century uh, message of the gospel, gospel presentation, you get this with Polycarp in these first two paragraphs. Two sides of the same coin. It's all the gospel, but two sides. The first side is the way into the kingdom of heaven. And the second side is the way of the kingdom of heaven. So the first side, the how you get into the kingdom of heaven is it's by grace through faith, not based on what you did, right? What what Jesus did, but you got to put faith in him. And that's the way into the kingdom of heaven. That's how you get born again. The second side of the same coin is the way of the kingdom of heaven, which is following his example or being a copy of the true love, right? Laying down our life. Um, like he did. Uh, and that's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's a lot easier to get into the kingdom of heaven than to live out the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's a challenge, like just to, to live and to behave in a way that honors God and is in line with what the teachings of Jesus were. I mean, loving our enemies, that's tough. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, praying for those who persecute us. Yeah, that's that's really hard. So, yeah. Do you have any? Um, do you have any closing thoughts on Polycarp? Um, I think this is. It's been really cool for me to do some of this reading because it's so dense with so many different passages, and you know, it's like just like reading scripture basically, but um, he's pulling from all over the place to sort of show this, um, these theological statements 
through it. But I, I think also, I mean, it always, it strikes me when people are pulling from various places of the Bible for something like this too. Um, also the, it shows like the unity of the Bible, mm-hmm. you know, so many different authors, but that there is this continuous message and that there is harmony in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and with that, you're seeing a guy that was trained very well. Mm. He's trained uh, with a very deep knowledge of scripture and how they all work together. And um, it's it's just really cool. Like it, it, it's one of these cliches that if you cut Polycarp, you know, he would bleed scripture. Mm. He's He's writing this letter to a church and it's just flowing from him. Mm. It seems very much like a New Testament letter. Mm -hmm. And um, what an amazing job John did discipling this guy. Six 